Joshua chapter 3. I don't know if you're going through a battle right now in your life. Sometimes they just kind of just come one after the other. But I want to remind you of something. And we talked about this actually on Sunday morning when Paul was exhorting. We were reading about how Paul was exhorting Timothy to fight the good fight. Remember? And we made the point that our Christian walk is in fact walked on a battlefield. It is, it is, uh, it is a constant battlefield sort of a situation. And as we're looking at the, the book of Joshua, as the nation of Israel goes into the land of promise, we find that that is a symbolic picture for you and I of what it means to go into the promises of God, to, to cross over and begin to walk out the promises of God. Do you know there are people, do you know there are Christians who are living in the wilderness? Do you know there's Christians who never cross the Jordan and go into the place of promise? I don't know if it's because they just don't want to fight the battles. I, you know, it seems like there's plenty of battles out in the wilderness too. But they're satisfied with, you know, just kind of living in the wilderness. And they're, we call them wilderness Christians. And essentially they are characterized by an attitude that really, that embraces Christ and what he did on the cross, but never really walks in the victory of the cross. Because when you cross the Jordan into the promised land you now have to begin to walk out his victory. See, he's won that victory already, but that doesn't mean there isn't land to be taken. He tells you and I now, enter into your inheritance. How do we do that? By faith, right? Remember the nation of Israel came to, you know, the, the, the border of the promised land before that, 40 years before, and they did not enter in. Even though Joshua, who was a much younger man back then, and Caleb who were among the spies who went into the land, said to everybody, we can do this. We can do this. But it says the other spies said, no, we can't do this. It's a great land, but there's giants in the land. They're way stronger than we are. They have chariots. We can't do it. We just can't do it. We won't survive. We'll never survive. And they convinced the whole community of people to just literally throw back their heads and and, and howl and cry. And they cry out, why did you bring us here, Moses? Did you bring us here just to die? And, and on and on. And God said, fine, fine with you. And sent them back out in the wilderness for 38 additional years. They'd already been two years receiving the law. But he sent them out for another 38 to wander in the wilderness until that generation of adults passed away. And do you know why God did that? Because one of the things they cried was, our children will die. And God said, fine. It'll be your children who will go in and take the land. The ones you were afraid about will go in and they will take the land. And they will not die. They will be victorious. And we are now at that place. We have been at that place now here as as we've gotten into the book of Joshua. We're dealing with with the initial uh, elements of, of reaching the land of promise. We, we dealt with now some more spies going into the land. We dealt with that whole situation with going out and spying out Jericho. We discovered that there was a soul that needed to be saved. Remember last week in Jericho, Rahab, an unlikely person indeed, a, a woman who lived in prostitution and yet put her faith in the living God, and God held back the whole procession of judgment into the promised land so that he might take time to save this one woman, well, and her family. And, and now we're at chapter 3 here in Joshua, and we're finally at a place where we're getting ready to enter in. So let's pray. Father God, open our hearts. Open our hearts, Jesus, for your, to your word, to your spirit, to the ministry of wisdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. So they have not crossed the Jordan yet. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites carrying it, 
You are to move out from your positions and follow it. And then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But look at he says here. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark and don't go near it. Stop there for a moment. You guys remember, don't you, that the ark of the covenant is that symbolic, well, and it was more than symbolic for the Israelites. It was, it was the, 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 the manifestation, if you will, or, or the, um, I guess in the sense it was a symbol, but, but it, you know, God said, I will dwell among my people and I will, I will dwell among you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and this was the presence of God, if you will, to the, to the people of Israel. This was the, the manifest presence of God, the glory of God. And God gave them all kinds of rules about this Ark and not getting too close. Only the priests could carry it and so forth. And here he says, listen, when you guys, when you see the ark picked up by the priest, move toward the Jordan, get ready, move out, and so forth, but keep a thousand yards between you and the ark. Notice the distance. Always the distance. And you know what? The old covenant is all about distance. It's all about keep your distance. I am a holy God. And God was, was doing this to, to, to speak to them of his holiness. I am the Lord God of the universe who dwells in unapproachable light, you know, uh, and so forth. Distance, keep your distance. Keep your thousand yards away from the ark. Don't, don't, get, don't get any closer than a thousand yards. That's a, can you imagine some people, you know, probably rarely, if ever in their lives, got even the smallest glimpse of the Ark of the Covenant, even though they were right there in the nation of Israel, because when they would pack down, you know, and, and, and move, uh, they'd cover it with all these different things. The priests would cover it and so forth, the Levites, and, and they'd pick it up and carry it, and it's all covered. They didn't get to see it. Always distance. Now, that is the Old Covenant. But under the New Covenant, what are we told? Is it, is it still keep your distance? Is that what God says to us under the New Covenant? Hey, guys, I just want you to know, keep your distance. No! What does it say in the New Testament? Let us draw near. Let us come with confidence and draw near to the Lord, right? Why? Do, why, why the change? Did God just kind of have a different attitude? He got around to him. Well, you know, I'm kind of getting lonely. These people telling him always to kind of keep their distance. Remember even in, under the Old Covenant when he was giving the Mosaic Law? Don't even touch the foot of the mountain or you'll die. But suddenly it all changes. Under the new covenant, suddenly it's a whole different situation. Suddenly it's, you know, draw near, come near to the Lord. You know, let us come with confidence before the throne of grace that we might find mercy and so forth. Why the change? The blood of the Lamb. It's all about the blood of the Lamb. It's all about the sacrificial Lamb which has been sacrificed on our behalf, the one perfect sacrifice. And now because of that sacrifice, the invitation to you and I is, come draw near. Come. Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. 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 No longer stay away. I love that. I love you guys being under the new covenant. I love the new covenant. You know? I love it because in the old covenant, it was all, first of all, it was all about land. You guys know that. The whole, the whole point of the covenant really was land. Do this, I'll give you land. Do this, I'll bless you. You know, I'll bless your crops, I'll bless your kids, but I'll bless you in the land that I've given to you. Under the new covenant, we have a whole different sort of a deal. You know? The new covenant is expressed very beautifully in John 3.16, that whoever believes in him you know, will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the, that's the terms of the new covenant. Whoever believes. And what do we get? Land? No. Everlasting life. I'll take it. Thank you. Right? Best deal I've had all day. And you too. Now, verse 5 is also an important verse for us to look at because it says here in verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Your Bible may say, sanctify yourselves. If you have a new King James, I believe it is. But consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things uh, 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 among you. He, he, it literally means people. You're about to see the Lord work in a, in a powerful and amazing way, and I want you to prepare yourselves 
by setting yourself apart. What does that mean? If God came to you and said, I want you to sanctify yourself, what would, what would you do? Well, the Jews knew what to do. It involved all kinds of cleanse, uh, cleansing rituals. And, 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 you know, when they were going to come near the Lord, whether to offer sacrifice or to something, they would have to bathe themselves and then change their clothes. And they, they knew they had these rituals they had to go through in order to approach the Lord. Why? You might say, well, why do people have to bathe themselves? What's the, what's the big deal about that? Well, you see, God was... He's always making a point in the Old Testament. He's always using symbolic language to speak of things. You see, dirty, getting dirty is a picture of sin. And what God was telling the Jews in the old, under the Old Covenant was, you can't just approach me haphazardly. You have to be cleansed to approach me. Right? Because I am the living God. You must be clean to approach me. Now, does that mean you have to clean up your act in order to come to God? No. What God was talking to them through these, about these ritual cleansings, as it makes its way into the New Testament, is how we are cleansed and washed, you know, through forgiveness and ultimately forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ and the redemption that we have through accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, so, you know, this whole picture of getting ready, get yourself ready, get yourself cleansed because God is going to be among you in a powerful way means essentially there is a need for cleansing. You and I recognize that as spiritual cleansing. By the way, do you know this is something that Christians sometimes get confused about? We talk to people, you know, when we're, when we're inviting someone to pray with us to receive Christ as Savior, We'll talk to them and we'll say, we'll say, you know, you just you need to pray, you need to ask the Lord into your heart, and 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 the result will be he you will be forgiven of all of your sins. And they they usually think that's a pretty good deal. And so they'll pray, and then come to find out, we start telling them things like, Oh, by the way, you need to pray like every day and ask God for forgiveness. And they're and, and they can be confused and say, wait, wait a minute here. Didn't, when I prayed to receive Christ, you said my sins would be forgiven, right? Past, present, and future, right? That's right. Sins are forgiven, past, present, future. Well then, wait a minute. Why do I need to keep praying for forgiveness? Why did Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer that we were to say, you know, forgive us our debts or forgive us our sins or however it's translated in your Bible, uh, uh, you know, as as we forgive those who sin against us and so forth. Why, why that? Why, why is that necessary? I thought I prayed the prayer. Prayed the prayer, it's done, right? We, we struggle sometimes with that difference between the idea of being redeemed and being cleansed. See, cleansing comes when we confess our sins and we say, Jesus, I need you to, to, to wash me. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to forgive me. Now, the wonderful thing about what happens for you and I when we invite Jesus into our lives is we take part not just in cleansing. We take part in redemption. And redemption is essentially justification, meaning that God justifies you. And you know what? You, you've heard that little word play on justification. It is just as if you've never sinned. You are acquitted, right? But there's still an ongoing need of cleansing for daily sanctification and relationship. Okay? This is important to see. Let me show you a scripture actually from John chapter 13 because Jesus talked about this and it says Jesus answered those who have had a bath. In other words, what he's saying is those who have been washed completely only need to wash their feet their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. And of course, he was talking, you know, about Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. But what Jesus is saying in this passage is, and you'll remember that, that this statement was made essentially to Peter when Jesus was, was uh, going to wash their feet, remember? And, he, and, and Peter at first said, I don't want you to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, I have no part of you. And he said, fine, then wash everything of me. And, and, and Jesus goes on, he says, listen, you're already clean. When, you, when you've had a bath, 
meaning when you've been cleansed, when you have been, when you've been forgiven, it, it's, it's a done deal. But you still might need to wash your feet. Why? Because we walk around in a world every day and we walk through garbage every day. And it's not literally our feet. That's, again, a picture of what we need in order to, to, to come before the Lord. We've been cleansed from the standpoint of redeemed. Our sins are forgiven. Listen, you're going to heaven. The, the foot washing or the, the cleansing that we get is to just, for relationship, to be with the Lord, to connect with the Lord. That's why Joshua says to the people, sanctify yourselves. Go through this cleansing because the Lord's going to be here in a powerful, miraculous sort of a way, right? So, so prepare yourself and so forth. So you and I come to the Lord for cleansing, hopefully every day. Lord, forgive me for my sin. But I'm not getting saved again when I say that, and, and neither are you, right? We're already saved. We got saved when we were redeemed, when we were justified, and our sins were forgiven in terms of the eternal consequence. But there are ongoing daily sins which can easily separate us relationally from the Lord. Just like in human relationships, you know, if I violate my friendship with you, I need to get that right. I need to come to you and say, I really messed up. Would you forgive me? And then our relationship can be restored. But, you know, sin always puts distance, doesn't it? Whether between people or between you and the Lord. Doesn't mean that you're not saved. Doesn't mean you're not a child of God. No, you've been redeemed. But there's that, still that sin issue. So Jesus taught us. Come, come before the Lord regularly and say, you know, forgive us our sins. So Joshua, verse 6, took the priests, or I'm sorry, Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. Remember, the ark is the presence of God. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the ark of the covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go stand in the river. Joshua, now by the way, this isn't a little stream. We find out that the Jordan is at flood stage. And that means that, you know, it's, it's probably fast moving and deep pretty quickly. So just keep that in mind, all right? Joshua said to the Israelites, verse 9, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Boy, what does that tell you about the battles you and I fight when we go into the land of promise? What does that tell you? God goes before you. Isn't that right? That's what he says. That's his promise. You go in, you're going to go fight the battles of the Lord. I'll go before you. I'll go before you. I'll lead the way. Right? You know, he's not following. He's not bringing up the rear. He's leading the way. Now then, he says, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. He'll tell them in a minute why. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, as soon as they did, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at the town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, meaning the Salt Sea, was completely cut off, so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Stop there. This is a great example of faith, you guys. Because by faith, the priests walked out into this flood stage river. By faith, because they'd been told, when your feet hit the water, it's going to stop flowing. So, just step out. Guys, this is a picture. This is a picture for you and I of what it means to walk by faith from the standpoint that many times 
God isn't going to, he's not going to dry up the situation necessarily before you take that first step. The situation that you're facing, the battle that you're facing right now may continue to rage in front of you until you take that first step and even and possibly after that first step. But what I'm saying is this is a picture of the fact that stepping out in faith is a biblical idea of responding to the Lord's word out of obedience. They didn't, ju- they didn't walk out into the river haphazardly, casually, recklessly. It wasn't like, hey, let's grab the ark, you guys, and let's step out on the water and see what happens. There's none of that going on. They heard from God. He said, listen, here's what we're going to do. This is what's going to happen. It's going to be a powerful miracle. When you step out into the water, boom, you're going to see it happen. I'm going to dry up the river just like that. I'm going to stop the water upstream, and it's going to just run down to a trickle, and you're going to be able to walk across on dry ground, which is pretty crazy even to think about dry ground too. But, you know, what God said was, this is what I'm going to do. What did they, what did they do? They said, okay, we're going to do that. Guys, that's faith. That's faith. It's responding to the promise uh, of, of God. You know, when you read chapter 11, and, and obviously we're not going to do it tonight, but when you go to chapter 11 in Hebrews, which is that great chapter of faith, you know, you learn that the people mentioned there all did something. And that was they took action on their faith. That's what you read about when you read about that, that great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. They took action. That's why James says later in his epistle, faith without action is dead. You can say all day long, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. God says, all right, step in the river. All right, I have faith, I have faith. But if you never step, James says, well, then it's, it's, it's dead. It's not alive until you go, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey. And so, you know, the faith of those in Hebrews chapter 11 was never a passive thing, you know. They didn't just talk it. They acted on it. They acted on it as the Lord gave them direction and so forth. It was a, it was a forward-moving thing. Verse 17, the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Chapter 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan from right where the priest stood and to carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. So these are obviously not small stones. They have to put them, you know, hoist them up on their shoulder. According to the number of the uh, tribes of the Israelites to serve, look at this, verse 6. This is important. To serve as a sign among you. And in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? They're all piled up in a heap there. Well, you're to tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. Thus, these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. It's to be a memorial. What is a memorial? Something that calls to memory. Something. Consider it an altar of faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Okay? An altar of his, uh, uh, that, that points to his, his deliverance, his power to deliver. When's the last time you built an altar? I'm not talking about going out in the river and finding stones and putting them in a heap. But I'm talking about some kind of remembrance. That, you know, this is a great parenting tip, by the way. Our faith is never to be something hidden from our children. We're to tell them, hey, 
See that rock heap over there? That altar, that memorial, that remembrance of God's faithfulness? Let me tell you what that's all about. So the Israelites, verse 8, did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down and Joshua set up 12 stone, the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood and they are there to this day. And now the priests, at least when they wrote this down, now the priests who carried the Ark remain standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people. Just as Moses had directed Joshua, the people hurried over. I'm sure the priests appreciated that. And as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, armed in front of the Israelites. Remember, they were the ones who were planning on staying with their families on the other side of the Jordan, but they came over to fight as Moses had directed them. Verse 13. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. And that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they revered him all the days of his life just as they revered Moses. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. And so Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And no sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to the place and ran at flood stage as before. Wouldn't that have been fun to see? I mean, there's no questioning what might have, I wonder what caused that river to stop flowing. I mean, as soon as they, it says as soon as they stepped up onto the, onto the shore, shoo, this thing just returns to flood stage. Wow, how exciting. Verse 19. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just as he had done to the Red Sea when he dried up before us. Uh, excuse me. When he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. The fear of the Lord is a good thing because it keeps you from sin. This is a wonderful passage. We're not ready to fight yet, I'll tell you that. We've got a little more preparation to go before we actually engage the enemy. We'll get there. There's some important insights that we will gain from the coming chapters about preparation for battle. You know, spiritual warfare is never to be waged haphazardly. Because we're walking in the power and strength of God, right? The teaching you've just watched contains notes and prayer points. The video play window contains a link for you to click on. It's circled in red. You will be redirected to the notes and prayer points archive.